morning, everybody. Um, I got very good news from the organizers just before I um, got up to speak, and that is that I should uh, shorten my speech. Uh, that's probably good news for you, too. Um, yesterday, uh, we heard from thought leaders, we heard from uh, business leaders about the uh, context in which uh, Polish business and European business uh, is now uh, operating and functioning. And what I want to do just very briefly this morning is bring to you a perspective from a policymaker, a political leader, um, somebody who has served in, in government. And I want to talk about the experience uh, that I had over uh, a four-year period uh, being part of the leadership of the government of my country uh, during a period of very deep uh, economic uh, crisis and how we handled that and perhaps draw a couple of lessons from it. Ten years ago, I was elected the leader of my party, the Irish Labour Party. I had served in the Irish Parliament for about 20 years. I had held many parliamentary and uh, party positions. And this was a great honour for me, to become leader of my party. Uh, and I had an ambition for the party. Uh, up to then, it had always been the third party in Irish politics, usually getting around 10% of the, uh, uh, about 10% of the vote. Uh, and what I wanted to do was I wanted to make it a larger party, to make Irish politics a, a three-way contest, contest, and to a large extent, I succeeded. Because within three years, by 2010, we had risen, my party had risen in the opinion polls to over 30%. Uh, I was the most popular political leader uh, in the country. And in the 2011 general election, although we didn't quite hit those dizzy heights in our results, we got the best result in the history of the party, the largest parliamentary party, the largest vote, and a couple of months later, uh, we succeeded in our candidate won uh, the presidential uh, election. But all of that success came at a time of deep economic crisis because a couple of months before the 2011 election, our country had gone into an IMF uh, bailout. The Troika, representing the IMF, the European Central Bank and the European Union were in Dublin and they, were, they had a program which was very tight, which was going to really tie the hands uh, of a, a new uh, government. One of my colleagues said that the country is in receivership. Um, our banks were collapsing, the property bubble had burst, the construction industry, which had been up to that point about 20% uh, of our economy, was in free fall. Unemployment was rising. Uh, we had gone within the space of a couple of years from full employment uh, to uh, unemployment rate of uh, over 15%. Our public finances were in a mess. We were spending 10 euros for every seven that we were raising in revenues. Our debt to GDP ratio was 120%. Our deficit in the previous year was 30%, uh, although that probably overstates it. The underlying deficit was probably around, uh, was probably around 13. And Irish bonds were being treated by the rating agencies as almost junk, and we couldn't borrow uh, in, the open, uh, in the open market. Um, our population was traumatized, some of them because they had suffered directly from the crash, lost jobs, lost businesses, lost savings. Um, some because they couldn't simply understand how we could so quickly go from being a prosperous, successful country, the Celtic tiger of Europe, uh, to a country into which the IMF had sent its people. This was something that happened to third world countries, uh, not to uh, con developed countries uh, in, uh, in, in Europe. I remember during the general election campaign of 2011, walking around streets, which of course is what political leaders do when you're glad handing and uh, saying hello to everybody, and uh, walking into shops on main streets. There were no customers. The only shops in which I found customers during that election campaign were grocery stores and pharmacies. But everywhere else, nobody was, uh, uh, nobody was, nobody was buying. And that was the kind of atmosphere in which uh, uh, I became Deputy Prime Minister of my country and Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade at the beginning of 2011. And we had, uh, we had six things we needed to do uh, to deal with our economic crisis. First, we had to fix the banks. 
because every economy needs a functioning banking system. We had to renegotiate the terms of the program with the Troika and get out of that deal, get out of that bailout as quickly as possible. Thirdly, we had to solve the problem of our public finances. Fourthly, we had to get the economy to grow again, which meant uh, seeing jobs created in the economy. Fifthly, we needed to do it in a way that was fair, that minimized the impact on poorer people, uh, on, on uh, people who were in a weaker uh, position, and we had to preserve uh, public services. And sixth, we had to restore our country's reputation, which had been enormously damaged uh, during the period of the crash. On the banks, we had six major banks, with six uh, Irish-owned banks. Two of them had already collapsed and were in a state of wind-down. Two of them had effectively been taken over by the state in the uh, previous number of years, and the other two were still in private ownership. Um, the previous government had provided a blanket state guarantee for the banks in the belief that a strong state would save the banks. It worked the other way around. The banks almost uh, pulled down the state. And they had also set out in an incremental way to recapitalize the banks and to try and resolve uh, their difficulties. The problem with that was that each incremental step that was taken raised the question, how deep is the hole? How bad is it going to be? So what we decided to do when we uh, came into government was that we would have a one-shot resolution. We would do it once, uh, and that we would do it at a high level. So when we did our stress tests in March of 2011, we took the worst case scenario, we restructured the banks, and we recapitalized then at the highest uh, possible uh, level. It was not a popular decision, because the popular mood in the country was that the banks should go to hell, uh, and that they had caused this problem, and that the taxpayers should not be bailing them out. Our second problem was, at that time, that we had to do it on our own, because at that time, the prevailing view in Europe and the dominant view in the European Central Bank was that if a bank failed, it was a country's problem. It wasn't a European problem. Uh, and we were left, this was before there was a banking union in the, uh, in the European Union, we were left very much on our own to deal with our own uh, banking, uh, banking problem. And indeed, uh, I might say that some of the difficulties that we have seen in more recent times in relation to attitudes to the European Union uh, and the lack of solidarity uh, in the European Union, I think had, a lot of it had its origins in that period of time when there certainly was a perception in many member states that the banking crisis was being played for national advantage by some of the stronger countries uh, in the European Union to the disadvantage of some of the smaller and weaker ones. We had to deal with the Troika. Uh, the Troika had a program which would effectively have meant that we would have had to sell effectively all our state assets, cut social welfare, reduce wages. For a Labour Party, this was impossible. So we had to renegotiate uh, some of those terms. And by working with the Troika, by winning their, their confidence over a period of time, we succeeded in reducing the interest rate uh, that was being charged on the loans they were giving to us. We succeeded in negotiating a flexibility to allow us to do things that we wanted to do, particularly in the social uh, area and thirdly, we eventually succeeded in persuading uh, the European Central Bank to allow us to restructure uh, some of the money that had to uh, go, into the, um, uh, go into the banks, uh, the net result of which was we were able to exit uh, the bailout uh, on time at the end of 2014. Solving the problem of the public finances um, was not going to be easy. We had to make a 20% adjustment in our national budget over a four-year period. There is no easy way of doing that. There was a difference, it was a coalition government. Uh, there was a difference between the two parties in government. Our party, uh, our, our partner, uh, wanted to do a ratio of three to one. Three to one reductions in public expenditure uh, to one part uh, taxation. The Labour Party wanted to do it on a 50-50 basis. Uh, everybody was agreed on what the target should be. It was really a question of how long it would take and what were the ratios. We ended up doing it, it was about 56% public expenditure, 44% uh, on, the, um, uh, on the revenue uh, side, but it was all painful. Every public expenditure cut affects somebody, uh, every tax measure uh, is, uh, is painful. 
on one issue we were absolutely agreed, and that was that you couldn't solve this problem just by budgetary measures alone. This was not going to be simply a fiscal solution, that there had to be a job strategy. There had to be a growth strategy. We had to get the real economy to, to grow again, which meant increasing employment. Again, going back to 2011, that was not the predominant view in Europe. Uh, we've just had the first round of the French election. I remember five years ago when the French presidential election took place and President Hollande's big uh, demand at that time was that there needed to be a growth strategy for economic recovery in Europe and some of you will recall the idea that he put forward of having a jobs compact. And that was very much in line with the thinking, the policy, our policy thinking at the time. So we did a number of things. We decided, first of all, that we would concentrate on tourism. We could get quick wins in terms of getting people back to work uh, in tourism. On the construction industry, we decided that, okay, there's not going to be big residential construction, but maybe, you know, we need schools. Uh, uh, so we decided on shifting uh, the construction activity to infrastructure, to schools, uh, to the retrofitting for, for uh, uh, energy conservation in order to preserve jobs in construction and to try and grow some of them. Uh, we developed what we called a jobs action plan. I still remember the morning that we launched it and I remember the skepticism that I could see on the faces of the press who were gathered uh, to hear about it because they had heard all of this before about creating jobs but we did succeed over that period of time in meeting, in fact in exceeding the targets that we set in the jobs action program. On exports, because we're le we've always been an export-led economy, we decided on a new and a, an increased drive on exports. And one of the things that we did was that we decided to make the private sector part of this effort. We established an export trade council with representation of the private sector, looked at each sector of the economy, what needed to be done in order to drive exports and thereby generate employment. Attraction of foreign direct investment was linked to improving our reputation uh, as a country. And one of the things that we did, both in relation to attracting foreign direct investment and to improving our trade prospects, was to involve our diaspora. We have a big diaspora throughout the world. We're a small country, but uh, just under 5 million population now in the Republic of Ireland, but we have a diaspora throughout the world, and particularly in the United States, about 70 million people. And we decided to harness that resource, and we established what we called the Global Irish Economic Forum, where we asked people who were leaders in business throughout the world and who had an Irish connection or were born in Ireland or were from an, a, an Irish uh, background to come and help, them, help us. And we brought them, and I remember the meeting that we had with them, which I hosted, about 300, uh, about 300 uh, corporate leaders uh, from different industries, different businesses, and they were enormously helpful to us and gave us their time and gave us their, their thinking and their expertise, and it was enormously helpful uh, to government to have that advice uh, available to us. Doing it fairly, uh, how did we, we, we set out to, um, uh, first of all, to, we had to reduce the size of the public sector and to reduce pay in the public sector. And we decided we would do that by negotiating with the public sector trade unions. It was difficult, it was slow, uh, but we succeeded in doing that. On taxation, the previous government had introduced new taxes. We decided we wouldn't put any additional taxes on employees or, or on work. Instead, we decided to reintroduce uh, a form of property taxation, something that, yes, it broadened the tax base, and that's what all of the uh, experts told us we should do, but it turned out to be uh, quite a, an unpopular uh, measure. Uh, on reductions in public expenditure, we decided that we would not reduce basic rates of social welfare or social protection, but we did have to reduce some of the secondary benefits uh, that were associated with that. On wages, the previous government had reduced the minimum wage. We decided to uh, restore that, to, to increase it uh, again, and we've set out to maintain uh, public, uh, public services and to minimize uh, the amount of sell-off. On country reputation, we were enormously conscious that there was a perception of our country that it was our own fault. If you remember back to that uh, early period, of that period of time, remember the pigs? Who were the pigs in Europe? The pigs in Europe were Portugal, Ireland, Greece, and Spain. And there was an attitude among some within the European family that this economic uh, crisis, the, the fact that we were in programs, was our own fault. Uh, and the uh, thinking 
among some in the uh, European family at that time was that the priority was to uh, keep it at the periphery and make sure that there was not, uh, uh, was the, that there was not contagion. So in that environment, we had to set out to improve our country's reputation. It's why I decided uh, to take the portfolio of the foreign ministry and the, and the trade ministry to lead that effort to improve the reputation uh, of, of our country. And we did that through diplomatic means. We were also fortunate that we had the presidency of the European Union, the chairmanship of the OSCE. Uh, we won election to the Human Rights Council of the United Nations. We had a number of, of, uh, uh, of, of fortunate, I suppose, coincidences that enabled us uh, to enhance the reputation of the country uh, at, that, uh, at that time. But we also did it directly by continuing to promote our values, continuing to maintain our aid program, for example, even at a time when the economy was, was poor. The commitment that we had made to peoples in Africa and Latin America and in other uh, poorer countries, we decided consciously that we would maintain that, that, uh, that commitment, that we would continue to maintain our commitment to peacekeeping in the United Nations, that we would still send troops as we did, for example, to the Golan Heights at a time when other countries were pulling out of, uh, of that commitment because we believed that our reputation was based as much on the values that we represented as much as our econo economic success. The outcome, well, we exited the bailout. Many people thought we would end up in a second uh, bailout. Uh, we have once again become the fastest growing economy for the last two years, fastest growing economy in Europe was Ireland. I'm not so sure about this year. We're facing very stiff competition from Poland, uh, but you know it's uh, it's friendly competition. At least we're at the right end of the uh, at the league table. Unemployment. We reduced unemployment. It was 15 percent uh, the day that I took office in 2011. It's now down to six percent. I made a speech sometime during that period where I said we should aim to have full employment by 2020. We will have full employment uh, by uh, by by next year. We got the deficit down to, uh, it's now under, uh, under 2%. And we managed to do that while at the same time also doing the kinds of things, for example, that a Labour Party should do. We increased the minimum wage twice. We introduced legislation to protect the pay of lower paid workers. Uh, a trade union leader, I was listening to him at the weekend at my party con congress said that we were the only country in the world during that period of economic recession where the rights of trade unions were increased and enhanced. We introduced legislation to increase the right to collective bargaining and to trade union, uh, trade union membership. But the political outcome was not as good. Uh, both part in the general election last year, both parties in government lost heavily. Like other social democratic parties in Europe, particularly social democratic parties who were in office during the period of the recession, the Irish Labour Party was punished particularly by the electorate. Our number of seats dropped from 37 to 7. Uh, and we have an enormous difficulty uh, of, uh, of, um, uh, of, of, um, uh, of rebuilding it. There are still risks. Uh, we have a minority government. Um, there are difficulties in uh, getting decisions made. Uh, we have risks because our construction industry has not fully recovered and there's a shortage of housing supply, so we're seeing some heating again of the housing market. And we have, of course, a new and unexpected risk uh, since last year as a result uh, of Brexit. What are the lessons that we've learned from this? The first is that, as Bill Clinton famously said, the first thing that you should do in a crisis is face into it. And that's what we did faced the crisis and dealt with it. And that's where I think, that is I think the first lesson we need to learn. The type of issues that were being flagged for us here yesterday by some of the speakers, we need to face into them and we need to address them and find solutions to them rather than leaving them as an excuse or as a means by which uh, particularly those uh, on the populist end of the political spectrum uh, can exploit. The second lesson is that you should always do the right thing. I remember when we had to uh, make the decision, should we enter government at the beginning of 2011? After our great electoral success, the t political temptation was to let the poisoned chalice pass uh, and to stay in opposition and to wait for a better day. We took a conscious decision that it was in the country's interest that we, we enter government. We did it with our eyes open because I remember at the conference where I recommended this course of action uh, to our members, I said, you know, we have a very celebratory conference here today. 
uh, we've just won uh, our best ever election success. The next, if we take this decision, the next time we will meet in, in a conference, we will have to walk through a forest of placards. And that was exactly the way it was. Many of the things that we had to do were counterintuitive, uh, were difficult to do, but they were the right thing to do. And notwithstanding the, the political consequences, I'm glad that we, uh, that we did so. The third is that you can never walk alone. And I think that that is probably the big lesson for today's, for today's world. The idea that problems can be solved solely within a national uh, context, solely within uh, national uh, uh, borders, is not realistic in the world, the globalized world uh, in, which we are, uh, in which we are living. In politics today, we're seeing the rise of populism uh, and nationalism, the consequences, if you like, of, uh, of globalization. But I think we're seeing some or something deeper than that. I think it is about a change in the nature and conduct of politics uh, itself. The Industrial Revolution, uh, the Industrial Age, was what gave rise to parliamentary democracy, uh, to the nation state, uh, to the way the form, the political, the forms of political organization that we have become familiar with uh, over the past several decades, forms of uh, political parties and so on, so on. That is changing fundamentally, and I believe it is changing fundamentally because of the changes in information uh, technology, the changes in, uh, in, communi uh, in communications. The platform for the conduct of politics uh, is shifting. Uh, in my country, the, uh, when I was growing up, when I was a child, the politicians came to the church gate to make their speeches. That's where political debate uh, took place. Outside the churches, after second mass on Sunday, politician would get up on the wall, make the speech to the, uh, the congregation. Somebody might heckle them, somebody might, uh, might, uh, uh, might challenge the point that was being made. That's, that's how I remember polit political debate being taken place. And then it moved uh, to, uh, to, to television. Now it's largely online, and we're seeing political movements developing online. The Arab Spring was organized uh, online. The, uh, uh, the Momentum Movement, uh, I was in Hungary for a number of months, what we saw there, the Momentum Movement that developed around the proposal that the Olympic Games should be held in Budapest, it was all done uh, uh, on, uh, online. Uh, in my own country, a lot of the uh, mobilization of people around the same-sex marriage uh, referendum that we had uh, two years ago. But it doesn't translate, it, it, it grows, very often single issue, and then uh, it, dis um, uh, it, dis um, uh, it, it disappears. The way in which political messages are constructed and are communicated has changed. When I started in politics 30 or more than 30 years ago, a political statement was something that maybe ran to two pages, several paragraphs, well thought out. Then it became the soundbite to uh, uh, appeal to you know, uh, local radio and the, the way in which that was developing. Now you've got to get it down to what can appear uh, on a tweet. And that means that it is being simplified. Political message are, is, are, is being simplified. And political messages are being simplified at a time that the issues that we have to, to deal with are becoming uh, more, more, more complex. So I think the, uh, the, 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 what, is, what is happening is this simplification of, of the message this appeal to a kind of a, an instant uh, gratification, and I think a shift in political debate from long-term thinking to short-term uh, solutions, or at least uh, attempted solutions. And what I want to say to you this morning is that that is not a problem that can be resolved by those of us in the political space alone. This is not a problem that can be re resolved solely by, uh, uh, by, uh, uh, by, by politicians and pol by political leaders who have to work Within that, uh, within that context. Issues, for example, of taxation, I think will require the cooperation of the corporate uh, sector. Issues of employment conditions, conditions and the security of employment and the difficulties facing the precariat are not issues solely that can be resolved by people in the political space. They are going to require the active participation, particularly of people uh, in, in business. Throughout my entire life, I have always listened uh, to, to business. Uh, always heard the messages. You've got to reform the public sector. You've got to reform industrial relations. You've got to reform the regulatory environment. You've got to reform uh, land use planning uh, legislation. 
all of the different, and I've always been willing to respond to those. But I think in a way, I think we're at a moment where that message needs to be reversed because I think that, uh, I think that business also needs to look at the reform of the business environment and help to ensure that there is a, a reformed scenario. In a way, I think that what is taking place is not just a change in politics, but I think a change in the nature of citizenship. Citizenship is no longer about the nationality that's stamped on our passport. Citizenship, the concept of citizenship, I think has to be widened. It's citizenship in our community. It is, of course, our national citizenship. In Europe, it is also our European citizenship, but it is also our global citizenship. Uh, whether that is manifested by what we do to protect our environment and the, uh, and, uh, and the ecosystem. But above all, I think the big change that is taking place and the big challenge to the public realm and to the public space is the requirement for active citizenship because policy making and the public space and the pursuit of politics is no longer something that can be contracted out to professional politicians. It is something that will require a much more active engagement by citizens as individuals and by corporate citizens as business. And that really is the message that I want to communicate to you this morning. Thank you very much.